So that's that's um, Zizek's <laughs> critique, and it it has some strength. I think like Zizek's Zizek's not a, an idiot. Although sometimes it's easy to say that he seems quite idiotic in, in the way that he, he, he communicates, but his position, it kind of holds water sometimes, and it seems quite challenging. It would, it would be interesting to see how many of you kind of pick up the gauntlet that he throws down and see if you can, can do anything with it. It's very easy to use Zizek's argument to um, just right say really cruel things about stuff like really cruel things about headspace about mindfulness about Taoism, buddhism about hippies about anything like that it's very very easy to do that once you've got that perspective where you go that's just ideology all that stuff which is why one of the reasons why i keep giving you examples of of, of serious times when it's actually it feels like it's it's, it's of complete value and legitimacy in my own life and other people's lives, I suppose. But but I give you the examples about like, so my dad's died. So what do I turn to? Uh, philosophically, it, it, it helped me, right? But let's try and get something of the measure of um, Zizek's critique. So um, we'll not do the psychoanalytic stuff because it's it's of, of less importance. I think it's it's not prominent here. Understanding Zizek's position, it's made up of of a combination of Max Weber, classic text, and a German philosopher called Peter Sloterdijk, right, who wrote a book in the very late 80s in German called Eurotaoismus, <coughs> Eurotaoism, um, which was translated into English and published quite recently, maybe last year, um, as Infinite Mobilization. And Zizek gets his concept of um, of Euro Taoism um, from he gets all of his stuff about Western Buddhism and Taoism from Slotdai. Um But the I'll go back to the I'll do the Max Max Weber stuff first and the and then Slotdai just to recap. So most of you will have got this, but here it is spelled out. Um, Weber was a Marxist sociologist. Um, some kind of say that he was like one of the founders of the discipline of sociology, where he studies society to, to, to kind of work out what the hell's going on. Um, and he used um, a form of Marxist um, apparatus to interpret things, which we call base superstructure or crude Marxism or vulgar Marxism, in which the ideological, uh, the economic base, what actually the, re the actual economic reasons for a society being there determine the, for the characteristics of that society. So, you know, um, a market town. Why is a market town there? Well, the answer's in the name. It's there because it, there, there were markets there. Right? Or like an industrial town. Uh, it exists for industrial reasons. It's there because of land, labour, capital, stuff, raw materials, whatever. Port towns, you know, they're there because there's a port there. Towns where there was a bridge, right? They, they, these little. But the economic activity determines much of the character of that place. Um, which is why it's best to go somewhere where the main kind of activity is tourism. Uh, and, and kind of service industries and cosmopolitanism. You go to the swanky places of a city. Uh, you go to the centre of a city and you have a nice time. You don't go to the suburbs. You don't go to the... That's rubbish. Um, so that's it. Ideological superstructure, the education, family, mass media, religion, politics. These all feed into the values that keep people happy working in these, in these environments. So for Weber, you know, um, as I mentioned, the um, Protestants kind of ethic enables people to be able to cope with their shitty industrial stage jobs. That's always going to be necessary. So Zizek's argument is that in this era of kind of virtual work, online work and, and, and kind of increasingly fast mediate flows, literally flows of information, 
Uh, you need a philosophy that will enable you to, to, to function without melting down, falling to pieces. And that he identifies in Western, what he calls Western Buddhism, this newest iteration of Buddhism, this newest version of Buddhism or Taoism. Um, and he gets his other ideas from Peter Sloterdijk. And Sloterdijk, so his book, um, Euro Taoism, he, dis he critiques the same things that Zizek critiques. He talks about, he talks about um, Asia mania. So he's writing in the 80s, published in the 90s, translated recently into English. And he said there is um, a Western interest, a Western fascination with all things Asian, which is where, what we've been kicking about since the start of this lecture. But he uses again the surface depth metaphor image. And all the way, if you want to read Peter Sloterdijk's work, it's all really interesting. He, he talks about these are just surface appropriations, surface interests. So he argues that our surface interests in kind of um, Asian ideas, Asian food, Asian religion, Asian, Asian philosophy. It's all just surface, it's meaningless, and it's like, we, what do we do? It's like, instead of using knives and forks, we now use chopsticks. Like, that's the, that's the, there's no difference in what we're doing, but we might do it in a different style. We're still consuming, even if it's feng shui, even if we throw out all of the old stuff and declutter. We declutter and we move our stuff around, and we feng shui our house. It's still consumerism. Um... But in Sloterdijk actually is not like Zizek's. Sloterdijk actually thinks that there is really something important in the potential of a philosophical encounter between East and West, organized by um, Eastern styles of thinking. And it's because he used another binary, of fast and slow, which is that the modern world is fast and it speeds up and it accelerates and it wants to expand and grow and get faster and faster and faster. And that there is something philosophically, uh, well, culturally perhaps, and politically important perhaps, in slowing down, in stopping. So, so Sloterdijk actually argues that in what he calls, he calls it anthropotechnics, which is like technologies of the body. In Eastern ones, yoga. Sloterdijk likes yoga and meditation. And he argues that in practicing these kinds of things, if you're doing Tai Chi, Qigong, um, yoga, meditation, you are actually potentially challenging capitalism. Like you're, you're kind of, you're experiencing difference. You're experiencing something that can't be reduced to like the capitalist frantic life, the frantic pace of life and work and the world of work. So, Sloterdijk has a lot of great ideas and ultimately does not denounce this idea, this interest in all things Eastern. The problem with Sloterdijk is that he is an Orientalist in the worst sense. When you, when you read Sloterdijk, he absolutely simplifies the other. He simplifies India, he simplifies Asia into one thing and, and kind of imputes to it this potential world-changing capacity, and he, so therefore he's romanticised it in, the, in exactly the way that Edward Said talks about. So Sloterdijk doesn't actually um, dismiss Western Buddhism in the way that Zizek does. He actually thinks that there's a lot of potential there for cultural change, economic change even, maybe. Um, oh, other interesting... So, so Sloterdijk is mainly known for his, his theorisation of we live in spheres, he argues. We live in spheres. Humans create spheres, and they create spheres because we all need immune systems to protect ourselves. So we have our households, we lock our doors, we lock our windows. These are our immune systems. Then our networks in which we meet other people, they are our communities. And he says we live in these bubbles, these spheres, and we protect ourselves. He's most famous for writing and theorising in these terms. It's a bit like when Ray Chow is talking about brushes with the other as fate, like we become, we see the other sphere and go, ah, do I want to be part of that sphere or not? 
Um, so I wrote down, these are his key terms, um, and these are some of the metaphors that he uses when he thinks about the, the east-west encounter. And for him, what you need is not the surface of, like, going somewhere, you go to Wagamama, or you go to um, Yo Sushi, or that closed down, didn't it? Or you, go, you go to somewhere like that, that's just surface, that's fake, that's not real, that's not depth. But for Slotterdijk, if you genuinely get into this non-Western, non-capitalist stuff, life practices, anthropotechnics, then there might be some potential in that for real change. Zizek and him dis disagree about this, because Zizek's a Marxist and goes, no, no, no. This is all just bullshit. It's all just ideology. But um, Slotterdijk likes his yoga, and he thinks there is something in that. And I guess... Anyone who is involved in any of these practices can see how they're, on the one hand, fashionable, but on the other hand, perhaps valuable. So that's the structure of Zizek's thought here, really. Um, and to finish off this, this week, I wanted to um, go through some of the major landmarks of, of texts that are, are on this module, and also the important ones in scholarship in terms of um, the question of Easternism as a kind of ideology in the West. So this is in, in broadly chronological order, okay? Um, first one we know. It's not the first ever text, but this is the one where we've got our first set of theoretical um, concepts from. And it's Orientalism. And this book has... Um, been massively important across the disciplines, as you know. So its, it's argument can be summarised in different ways, and if you use the concept of Orientalism in your work, then you're going to have to say which particular aspects um, of it. For me, at the moment, I would say that the important point of Said's work is, is the way that he points out that Western thinkers and artists and intellectuals have tended or have a tendency towards romanticising and simplifying the East according to clichés that we, for different purposes, that we've discussed already and that we'll continue to discuss. Um, and then in the, in the 1990s, um, a guy called J.J. Clark, I don't know what, his, his, what the J.J. stands for. Um, I've never been able to find anywhere written down what J.J. stands for in J.J. Clark. He wrote a few books, um, some of uh, which I put on the reading list, and he does a long historical study. He's, he's famous for, well, he's important for three books. He wrote a book about Jung, you know, Freud's, um, Freud's kind of heretical disciple, Jung, um, who uh, Jung turned East. Jung was a psych, uh, psychologist, psychoanalyst, who explicitly got into um, Eastern philosophy. Um, and J.J. Clark wrote a book about, about that. Uh, pointing out interesting things like Jung was using incredibly bad translations of um, of Chinese and Japanese thought, so his ideas about that philosophy were, were skewed from the start by a bad translation. And then he wrote a book called Oriental Enlightenment, which is a really great book, and then The Tao of the West, which I've put, uh, suggested you look at for this module. These are big, thick books which look at lots of aspects of the different engagements, especially of, of European and North American thinkers with um, Indian and Chinese and Japanese and other East Asian philosophies and lifestyles. And he argues that yes, there's Orientalism, but it's not always a bad thing. It's not always a problem. And there may be some constructive, critical and progressive dimensions to Western Orientalism. So, as I've said, you know, a few times now. Orientalism doesn't mean racism. It doesn't mean, like, hatred. It can, in, especially in the stuff that Said looks at, in the biases in news representation and so on of, of the Arab world. Um, but J.J. Clark finds lots of potential in the cross-cultural encounters, even if they're imaginary, even if they're just imaginative, uh, like um, we talked about last week and the week before, even if you just imagine a different culture, a different world, and you've got there's no truth in that imagination, it can might still give you a critical perspective on your own culture, your own bubble, your own world. 
or that imagination might in some way reflect you know the things that you desire in your own world you might imagine a utopia of equality gender equality sexual equality blah 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 that imagination reflects what you think is lacking in your in your current world um, a really um, excellent book that didn't quite make it onto your formal reading list is this one it's called new age capitalism um, the subtitle is Making Money East of Eden by Kimberly J. Lau and this is um, an extremely easy to read and interesting book and she looks, she has um, three main chapters she's got a good introduction three main chapters and a conclusion the first chapter, she uses, actually she uses Ulrich Beck and the idea of risk society and the idea of you know, the kind of stuff that Zizek was, was kind of taking the piss out of and critiquing and saying Ulrich Beck and risk society, it's just the ideology of capitalism. She uses that to explain why people turn to these um, types of practice. So I'll read the quote first. So New Age Capitalism, New Age Capitalist ideology turns eastward for its inspiration and relies on sentimentalism and nostalgia for a lost past in order to participate in contemporary cultural dialogues about modernity and anti-modernity. So she chooses four case studies. She has a chapter on aromatherapy, a chapter on the macrobiotic diet, and then one chapter combining yoga and tai chi. Um, do we know what aromatherapy is? Yeah. Do you, does anyone do, have you heard of the macrobiotic diet? Yes. Hands up who has heard of the macrobiotic diet. One, two, three. Maybe you've not. Sh no. You might have heard someone else talking about it. Okay. That's it. That in itself is quite interesting. So her argument um, is that so aromatherapy. It's connected still really strongly to products like Aveda, Aveda, A-V-E-D-A, Aveda, that, 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 they, they make smellies, and the stuff smells nice, and it's quite pricey, it smells nice, it's American. But her argument is that, this, with aromatherapy, the marketing around that, the discourse around that, was one of um, the ancients. The ancients used aromatherapy, essentially. We didn't have a Vida then, but we've got it now, and the ancients used it in sacrifice, that's the whole, like gods don't eat the food, you sacrifice the lamb, the gods smell the food. So you get that now in the kind of Gwyneth Paltrow group, group kind of, I'm going to fast, that's how strong I am, I'm like a god, I live this ascetic lifestyle, I don't eat until I choose to eat. <laughs> I'll smell your food, but I'm strong. It's like that film. Dodgeball. In Dodgeball, you've got Globo Jim, and and uh, have you seen Dodgeball? It's absolutely excellent. And the guy who owns Globo Jim, he's like a little man who wants to be a big man, and he like sniffs food, and he has put a cake in front of himself, and, he, and he's he's like, I'm stronger than this. I'm not going to eat the right. And there is a long a long history. If you read Peter Slaverdyke, actually on this, it's quite interesting. The ascetic lifestyle where you go, no. I'm not eating. I'm just not going to eat. That's how ace I am. I'm not going to eat. He talks about the hunger artist. The hunger artist as this kind of often orientalized. If you look at a, a character like David Blaine, David Blaine was a street musician and then he kind of lost it a little bit and became, he, he decided he was going to be magical. So he totally orientalized himself and he's got kind of like Chinese Indian like symbols on him at different kind of acupoints on his body um, and he stopped doing magic and started doing things like sitting in a perspex box above the River Thames for as long for a month ironically in terms of the theme of this lecture at exactly the same time as my dad was dying and my dad went I'm gonna beat that guy because my dad just stopped eating he was like screw this I'm done I'm out here I'm going to starve myself to death. And David Blaine sat um, uh, in a box and said, I'm a magician. This is what I'm a hunger artist. I'm strong and magic. So, aromatherapy 
as a kind of or always orientalized. It's the past, it's the East, ancient Egyptians, ancient Greeks, ancient Chinese, right? Aromatherapy. And that somehow you buy this product and you participate in the smell of it and that it's going to just be good for you. You might like spray some essential oils on your pillow at night to help you sleep. And you might de-stress with the scent of a lavender candle or, or whatever it is. Or you might go in the bath and you've got some joss sticks burning so that the smell of your spliff doesn't carry too far. And all the rest of it, right? All these different scents. Aroma, so is the study of aromatherapy and the way in which is precisely what Zizek kind of talks about. This fantasy of the tranquil, the calm, the ancient, communing with the gods almost on a spiritual level. Because, of, because the gods can smell the, the sacrifice, but they don't eat it. Then a chapter on the macrobiotic, and the fact that you haven't heard about that is really quite interesting, because it was a massive diet, like it was, it was globally famous, it was internationally famous. And the macrobiotic diet, I guess it's splintered off into different sorts of diet now, different sorts of kind of um, paleo diets, and all that kind of stuff where you go, well, I'm only going to eat what the ancients ate because they were closer to nature and because I'm, I'm a body and it's a natural body, therefore I shouldn't eat sweets um, because they're not natural. And you get this kind of, again, another myth of purity. Like, I'm not going to eat sugar, processed sugar, because it's not ancient and it's not natural. I might eat some naturally occurring sugar. But I'm essentially going to eat a paleo diet. The macrobiotic diet was something that was very, very orientalized in much the same way that um, we looked at the, the Yakult idea, the Yakult advert. Um, macrobiotic was associated with Japan, it was associated with Japanese food and traditional Jap And this, it still pops up on like health programs now. They'll go, Jamie Oliver, they'll be going, well, who's got the best diet in the world? And they go to Japan and South Korea and somewhere else. And they go, in Japan, people can live until they're 400 years old because they only eat this fish prepared in this way. Um, and, and it goes on like this. And the macrobiotic diet was a kind of orientalist diet that was presented as scientific. That's the thing. That's the new thing, that the ancient and the natural is presented as objectively, scientifically true. And then yoga and tai chi, the chapter on, on yoga and tai chi, as inevitably practices that appeal to the ancient and the East. And they're also, they mark themselves off as different from Western practices. Her argument actually is that, is that practices like yoga and Tai Chi can be regarded as responses to the technology of the 1980s. So the 1980s was the, the period of proper gyms. You go to the gym, you do aerobics, you do dance exercise, right? You, you use pec deck machines where you kind of strap yourself into a contraption. Has anyone ever used a peck deck machine? They still have them. And you kind of, you kind of lock yourself into a machine like that and you go and it exercises your pecs. And it's a deck. And, and all of that technology, like in the Peloton, which is more recent, but all of that techno stuff, she says that Tai Chi and yoga, they were a reaction to that. Like, don't go to the gym. Air-conditioned, schmear conditioned peck decks, treadmills. No, get back into nature. Take your shoes off. Now that I've read this, they call it earthing. Earthing. So, <laughs> earthing. <laughs> so, take your socks and shoes off and stand on some grass and go, I'm now connected to nature again. Yay. That's earthing, people. Uh, so if ever you're feeling a bit like you're too far removed from nature, earthing, right? <laughs> um, anyway, 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 so it's a really interesting study of it, and the fact that this is already, well not already, because it was 2000, but this is completely out of date now, is interesting. So aromatherapy has survived, though, um, quite well. So, Zizek's book on belief um, is, is a hard book to read. If you are interested in theological stuff, um, it, it's, 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 even then it's still challenging. He writes about Christianity, Gnosticism, Judaism, da, 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 da. It's really dense, but I, I tend to skip through that stuff and get to the interesting stuff on Taoism and Buddhism. Give it a go. It, it's worth it, I think. Um, 
This book um, is called Selling Spirituality, which is on your reading list. It's on the secondary reading for this this week, I think, or maybe next week. Um, and the subtitle is The Silent Takeover of Religion. They kind of agree with the Zizek idea. So if you remember in Zizek, the, the, the idea that he's against is the idea that we are all truly individuals and free. Because we're not, we're a bit free, but we can't control being bounced around in kind of deregulated capitalist forces. Like, we're free, but we can't control that. We're quite free, but we can't control our income in the way that, you know, people might say. We're not that free. So, the idea of individualism, this would be another key word from this lecture and this theme. So, individuality and individualism is an ideology of, of liberalism and of, like, American ideology, the free society where each free to do what we choose as individuals. Um, in this study, Selling Spirituality, they talk about the way that in the West, the appropriation of um, non-Western spiritual traditions moves them from being genuinely kind of communal things with a community focus and like this interlinked um, social dimension to being individualized consumerist practices. So, you know, we may be uh, practicing our, our Buddhist meditation, but it's been abstracted from a, from a, a more organic existence. And it's been individualized so that we could become the, the kind of mental yuppie that, that, that Zizek kind of fantasizes. And that that in itself is a problem. So I've written there, Eastern religions and orthopraxy. So orthopra So there is an argument that in the West you have orthodoxies. Like, you have to believe these words. You have to believe this doxa. Whereas um, what we think of as Eastern religions, they're not... Religion is a Western Christian kind of a concept in itself, and that really different orthopraxies, different bodily ritualistic training and discipline. Um, so you don't necessarily have to believe anything, you just have to do some stuff. That's an orthopraxy. Um, so Eastern religions, I could have put religions in inverted commas, and orthopraxies that were previously communal and socially focused are individualized and marketized. So that's a, um, a good book. And then there was, um, there was a spate of scholarly activity in and around a few disciplines. And it was, it was um, called the Easternization Thesis. And people debated this. It was a bit like the Sloterdijk and the Zizek that I was lecturing about before. But done in a, in a very strange way. And I've, I've read a lot of this work, um, and I, it doesn't seem very... I don't buy it. It didn't seem good. I didn't feel easternized in the way that they said that I was. But the idea... You can look into some of this stuff. The idea that Western cultures and societies are being ideologically easternized in different ways. What does that even mean? But... You know, Google it. Go to the go to the library and look for you know the Easternization thesis. Don't Google it. I did Google it. I should have gone to the library, but um, couldn't be bothered. The same way that you can't be bothered when you come to do your research. Just log into the library. It's the best way. And then some tool um, called Paul Bauman or something wrote an essay called The Tao of Zizek. So this I have said he was reading, and I reread it. Um, and my interest is in that essay is more about kind of finding ways to pull Zizek to pieces a little bit rather than rather than dismiss him. I kind of I kind of I, I, I do agree with Zizek a bit but it never seems satisfactory so my argument is kind of that Zizek may have a point but his complicated theoretical paradigm may nonetheless be simplistic so my, one of the things I've always argued about Slavoj Zizek is that he just layers theorist on top of theorist, but that if you can unpick that, you get to some very, very simplistic formulations in Zizek, behind the kind of fog of, of all of his different, the different things he throws at an argument, is some really simple formulations, I think. 
And that the problem is that Zizek doesn't really analyze anything in particular to make his sweeping generalizations. So, in that sense, if you did an essay, if you wrote an essay for me that was like the kind of thing Zizek writes, wouldn't score very highly. You might get 50-ish, right? Because you have to analyze something. Like, say what you like about yoga or aromatherapy or, or macrobiotic diets or anything, but if you do it in general, that's just bleh. Like, analyze something specific, an actual thing. You can't just, like, dismiss an entire field of practice. Um, you, well, you can, but if you do it in an essay, you're not going to get much higher than about 50, 55%, because it's in general. Analyze something specific. If she actually looked at some stuff, some specific examples, you might come to different conclusions. So I've written there, compare with Melissa Gregg in, in Counterproductive, and I think we get to her soon. Um, Melissa Gregg wrote a book called Counterproductive that I, if I have time, I will, I will run you through. And she argues, sort of similar to Slot the Dag, but actually by studying something, she looks at, she goes into the, the business world in like Silicon Valley, right? She, she got a job, she left the university, she got a job, she worked in Silicon Valley. And she was interested in the way that mindfulness was kind of grown there as a thing to sell. Um, but also the way that it fostered different relationships between people. Like, yes, it's capitalist. Yes, it's commodified. And it's a, an abstraction from East Asian kind of traditions. But it changes stuff. It changes vibes, it changes the ethos, it changes practices. So we shouldn't just dismiss it all as, oh, it's ideology, therefore it's junk, get rid of it. Um, and a really um, interesting development that I only learned about quite recently, the last year or so, um, is a new term called conspirituality. And conspirituality is the rather surprising connection between conspiracy theory and spirituality. You tend to think these, one thing is quite feminized, spirituality is like quite a, that seems like quite a passive um, thing, or a, or a calm thing, a, a pacific thing, like a, a, a peaceful thing. It's conspiracy theory, uh, however, is a strange world, um, the strange world where, you know, you can start to kind of, you know, the, the earth is flat, is it? Okay, fine. Um, the, the vaccines aren't vaccines, they're injecting us with tracking devices. Okay, they invented COVID-19 so that they had a market for the vac. Okay, right. Um, it's all Bill Gates and it's all, and, and it's the Chinese and the government and and the Russians, and, and it's Hillary Clinton because she wants to eat babies. And you're like, then people just, this is the world that they live in. These, and it's like, wow. And conspiracy theories have really kind of exploded post 9-11. So, you know, 9-11, Twin Towers, da 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 Oh, it was an inside job. That was the first thing. It's an inside job. Someone in the American government wants to blah, blah, blah. It wasn't Bin Laden. It was, so, but the strength, so on the one hand you've got that, and on the other hand you've got spirituality. And these are very strange bedfellows. But what, what, since about 2010, people have been finding when they research the ideological beliefs of conspiracy theorists, or um, spiritual people, people go, I'm spiritual, I'm a pagan, I'm spiritual. Um, I don't believe in established Western religions, but I believe in Stonehenge and yew trees and going around the Maypole and all that sort of stuff, is that they often share the same outlook on the world, which is one of purity in nature. And we need to get away from Big Pharma. And in a sense, it's quite reasonable to be suspicious of Big Pharma. Like, you know, Big Pharma, who profit from people's pain and they profit from illness and they, they sell medications that would keep people alive for profit, but there's, there's no morality there, there's no ethics there, that's a kind of terrible um, relationship to the world. But, so there are, there's good reason to maybe worry about Big Pharma, but then you get pulled in because of this, into this world, 
And, and you want to reject that. We go back to primitive passions like Ray Chow was talking about. You want to reject Big Pharma. I'm not getting vaccinated. I'm not getting my kids vaccinated. I'm not blah. I am pure. All I'm going to put into my body is some magic mushrooms while I'm doing aromatherapy and, be, be, and I, while my macrobiotic diet. Because that's all natural. Do you, not, do you see the binaries that I'm kicking around here? So it's a very strange thing. And you might, you might find, if you do, for your essays and things, if you research the kind of questions like the beliefs um, that subtend that are informing a range of different sorts of activities, from conspiracy theorists to, you know, from proper QAnon stuff, to um, I'm just spiritual and um, I cut the mistletoe and I'm a druid and that kind of stuff. It's a thing. It exists. So be careful. Um, also, I wanted to uh, mention again um, the work of Chris Gauti Jones. I emailed you this. And I said, look at this lovely illustrated version of this essay. Zombie Apocalypse as Mindfulness Manifesto. So um, Chris Gauti Jones does really creative stuff and kind of connects the figure of the zombie, which, was, which is quite a popular cultural thing. Um, like a few years ago, my children were generally con genuinely concerned that there might be a zombie apocalypse. That's how, that's how much it is in popular culture, right? Um, I assured them that it had already happened. But that it's connected to um, mindfulness. Like, what, what is a mindfulness practitioner? Is a mindfulness practitioner actually just like a mindless zombie? And there's a lot of great themes... Um, in that, and just read it for a laugh. Just read it. There's, he talks about Zizek, you unpack Zizek's um, argument, and he connects it to kind of popular culture. You could write about. There's all sorts of stuff that you could that could it could inspire you. Themes that that might kind of spark an essay theme for you. Um, and another book that I'm gonna I'm gonna talk through the argument of this book in a future lecture uh, where we look at travel and stuff. So um, Dream Trippers, Global Taoism and the Predicament of Modern Spirituality by David Palmer and Elijah Siegler. This is a really interesting study of the circulation of different belief systems where he, he writes about, they write about the kind of American pilgrimage, American and European pilgrimage to sacred sites in China. And then th these people who have grown up as adults, experts on Taoism, experts on Buddhism, experts on Tai Chi and all the rest of it. And then they go to China and the Chinese people there are kind of going, what, what are you? What the, what, what the shit? Right? Like, what's going on? And it's a really interesting um, staging of, a, of an encounter between kind of Western Taoists and, and Chinese Taoists and what exactly happens in that encounter and it does so in a rather beautiful way without actually dismissing either as the fake or the authentic because those terms are like you know they're, they're, they're minefields aren't you as soon as you start talking about authentic versus fake but it's a really great text to read really readable as well very very readable text now last few minutes um, so counterproductive by um, Melissa Gregg she um, explores mindfulness in the workplace. So if you're Slavoj Žižek, and I don't know if you've encountered this yet, but in Cardiff University, the people who do the Headspace app, Headspace wants to prove scientifically that it's valuable and that it helps people, right? So what they've started to do is to open up um, free access to Headspace for di across different universities, and then you do surveys and say, well, well, did I feel better after doing Headspace, or did I feel not better after doing Headspace? And Cardiff University now does it. Like, I've got a free Headspace account um, because they want more weight to their claims um, about what Headspace will do for you psychologically and emotionally. And in terms of productivity, that's the thing. So, Slavoj Žižek critique would say, any workplace that introduces this stuff, desktop yoga, headspace, meditation, take time out to, 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 to you know, um, look after your well-being and brings wellness into, into the world. 
that is ideological because it's just trying to squeeze some more productivity out of you. Like, give someone half an hour to do some Tai Chi at lunchtime and they'll be more productive in the afternoon. And therefore it's just exploitative. But what Melissa Gregg does is actually um, unpacks that by actually studying what happens in those communities and in those contexts. And she disagrees with that, and she's not, an, you know, she's not an ideological, like an ideologue. She's not someone who's just she doesn't work for Headspace or anything. Um, she just argues that it's it actually changes. Um, it, it's a, it's an opportunity for community. So I'll read a couple of these out. I won't read them all. This so the turn to mindfulness can be seen as a response to the decline in collective opportunities to experience ritual in the workplace. As performed by Silicon Valley personalities, already famous for rejecting the temporality of the buttoned-up office, mindfulness continues an established tradition of finding enlightenment in alternative cultures that smooth the way for more stimulating business transactions. So that's kind of like, uh, that cuts both ways, doesn't it? In contrast, my account of the mindfulness movement explicitly links the desire for self-care through timeout with previous versions of labour politics. So she's saying, actually, the demand for time out from work cannot be disconnected from workers' rights, from being part of a union. Going, so, you know, concepts like the weekend and, and not working on Saturdays if you work in, in a normal nine-to-five type job. These are things that were given to us by unions. You, so we have our religious holidays. We have Sunday. We have the Sabbath. We have, we have Christmas that's religion, we can thank religion for that. Yay, thank you religion for those holidays. Saturdays and actual paid holidays, you thank the unions for that, the labour movement, who went, you're going to pay us for holidays, or we're not, we're going on strike and you're screwed. So mindfulness, she's saying, you can't disassociate it from, like, I demand my time, I demand the end of work time, and this is my time. There's something important there. Possibly. I suggest that the selfless qualities of meditation have the capacity to refashion a different relationship to time from the one enshrined in the organisational form. The ultimate question raised in chapter 4 of the book is whether an emerging practice of mindful labour can introduce ethics to the pursuit of productivity once the pact between time and self-sovereignty is suspended. Mindful labour may prove the best means currently available to reinsert collegiality and other and other oriented, so other oriented concern into the conversation about work futures. So she's got a kind of pragmatic take on it, like, yeah, we can see it's ideological, we can see it's connected to improving productivity, slash extracting surplus value from workers, but also what else is going on? This is, um, this what else is going on is an important thing. So in your essays and stuff, you might find Orientalism, that shouldn't be the conclusion of your essays. What else is going on? Like, does it do a good thing? Does it do a bad thing? Does it make us racist? Why do we enjoy it? What, why is it there? What is the Orientalism doing? These kind of, what else is going on? And then, um, I think this might be the last actually, yeah, more or less. The, um, the reading for next week, one of the primary pieces of reading is, is um, from this book, Buying Buddha, Selling Rumi, Orientalism in the Mystical Marketplace. So this picks up from where we're going to leave off this week. Um, and um, so Sophia Rose Arjana talks about Orient, Orient. She comes up with the concept of muddled Orientalism. I think all Orientalism is muddled. Um, but she connects it with Lots of interesting kind of moments and developments of, of Western colonialism. Because on the one hand, we might buy into something that's completely muddled, a practice that is some kind of weird amalgamation of something Indian and something Chinese and something we think it's Tibetan, and blah, 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 but really it was all just Californian and all this sort of stuff. So this is muddled Orientalism. But it connects to what she calls, well, what Michel Foucault calls technologies of the self. These are practices that make us, that build us. You know, if you do nothing but sit and watch television all day, that you're going to become a very different physical self to someone who 
exercises for an hour or two every day. That's a technology of the self. Um, and she looks at mysticism and the way it's connected to kind of colonial history. The idea of mysticism, she says, evolved as part of colonial history. Um, and words like Hinduism, you know, we've looked at the word Asia. That was, that's a Western word. It's a Western concept. Hinduism is a British concept. Um, and she, 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 she looks at the status of all of these things and the way that they um, kind of coalesce into modern consumerism now. Um, she argues that mysticism is mysticism itself, mysticism as a concept, is a Western concept invented by Western academics. Um, and the idea of the mystic poor, right, poor people, the poor Indians in, in, in British colonial Indi India, they're mystical because they're connected with an ancient yogic past. So you, you might have colonized them and you might have made them poor, actually you might have kept them as peasants, but then you start to kind of romanticize them and go, what can I learn from my mystic guide? That's a common theme. Um, I've also recommended that you um, could consider listening to the Conspirituality podcast. Some of the earlier episodes deal with the concept of conspirituality and quite if you're a podcasty kind of person um, who listens to podcasts hands up routinely you the, you like you just you've got a podcast that you listen to your new episode great I listen to that who doesn't listen to podcasts okay. good I like you better no no that's that fine um, yeah this is an interesting one this is, this is very, especially the early episodes, uh, and it would be interesting to see what you make of that. I find it almost unlistenable, but I like reading the kind of, the synopsis of each, each, each episode. So what have we done, and what time is it? It's ten past, is it? So we've looked at Eastern wisdom, we've looked at the modern world, uh, and the states of Eastern spirituality within that modern world. Spent quite a lot of time on Slavoj Žižek's critique because he paints a picture that um, makes it hard to it makes it hard to redeem certain practices in the West. You might read Žižek and go, ah, all of this other stuff, all of this East Asian stuff that I've been interested in, maybe I'm just a victim of ideology. But my my interest is is taking that proposition and seeing how you'd fight your way out of it. Like, how do you redeem a practice that's so intimately connected with, say, consumerism and orientalism and all these different forms of, like, problematic thinking uh, and, and say, well, it's valuable in these ways, maybe? Then we had our important mindfulness break and then, and then we've done the, the run-through.